And, and uh, Mr. Joseph Pinero, please just let me know when I should start. Certainly. Yes, it looks like we have uh, attendees funneling in from the waiting room. So I'll let you know when it looks like we've hit a good point there. All right, Chairperson, I think you're good to start. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I'm the Chairperson of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board, and you see the other members of the board on your screen. Welcome to our September meeting. I would first like to acknowledge that today is Rosh Hashanah, an important holiday in the Jewish calendar. I regret that we were unable to switch the days of this meeting so that the closed session discussion fell mainly today and the public discussion fell tomorrow. We are recording the meeting and I'll say a little bit more about that um, later in the meeting. Uh, for now, I would like to wish everyone who is celebrating Rosh Hashanah, Shana Toba, a good and sweet year to all. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone, please check that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. Additionally, as I mentioned, this meeting is being recorded. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, and I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item, please use the raise your hand function, which is, in, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself for comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but I want to stress that this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. I would like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your minutes to th keep your comments to three minutes or less. We do have a tight schedule today. Relat relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Key. Both board members and members of the public may discuss agendized items only. Items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose. It's number eight on today's agenda. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand function so our moderator can recognize you. For those joining later in the meeting, um, the uh, moderator would usually admit people between agenda items, but with the webinar, um, people may be coming and going um, uh, as the meeting proceeds, and that is just fine. Uh, we will take a break um, around midday uh, for lunch, depending on where we are in the agenda, and shorter breaks as needed. I'm just delighted to be with you this morning um, for this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. We have a full schedule over the next two days, and I would like to thank the board members for their service. These meetings also require a lot of work behind the scenes. I would like to thank Ms. Deborah Castanon for taking minutes, Mr. Chris Phillips for serving as meeting counsel, and Mr. Evan Joseph Pinero for moderating and managing the Zoom conferencing system. Um, I would also like to thank Deputy Secretary Leila Mirashidi for obtaining staffing and resources behind the scenes and the team at the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications list and website. I would also like to generally thank the staff at Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, um, fondly known as BISHA, the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of General Services, the Office of the Attorney General, and other agencies um, who have continued to loan time behind the scenes. I would now like to call the meeting to order and ask our moderator, Mr. Joseph Pinero, to please conduct the roll call. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so to call for roll, uh, board member Lydia De La Torre. Present. Board member Vincent Lay. Yeah. Board member Angela Sierra. Here. Board member Chris Thompson. Here. 
and board chairperson Jennifer Urban. Present. Thank you. Uh, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Anau. Um, The board has established a quorum. I would like to let the board members know that we'll take a roll call vote on any action items today. And with that, we will now proceed to agenda item number two, which is approval of the June 14th, 2021 meeting minutes. I would like to offer my sincere thanks to Mr. Phillips uh, for taking such thorough minutes. Um, he's our meeting council today, um, and he's responsible for the minutes from the last meeting. Do board members wish to make any additions or corrections to the June 14 meeting minutes? Uh, please raise your hand and I'll recognize you. Ms. De La Torre, um, followed by Ms. Sierra. Thank you. There are just a few things that I will request to be uh, revised for accuracy. Um, I, in, in pages four and seven, there is a discussion uh, that reflects the conversation we had on leadership positions, but it is my recollection that the agreement that we reached was that all leadership positions will be CEA roles, or we will um, try to make them CEA roles. I understand there's approval process for that. I would appreciate if the minutes could be corrected to reflect that agreement. I also um, noticed on page six, there's a reference to a statement that I made and it is not um, accurate. I, the, the minutes um, reflect that I have concerns related to making the chief deputy position a CEA position and that is not um, my position. I actually believe that all leadership positions should be CEA. Um, so I ask that that be corrected as well. Uh, on page six as well, we have a conversation about the staggering of positions, but it is unclear to me um, that the minutes reflect the agreement that we had, which was that um, positions should be posted immediately where possible, and that we should not wait to try to stagger the positions. So I, I request that that be also made clear in the minutes. I think I have one more thing. Um, yes. Oh. Give me a second. Yes, on page 17, where it talks about future meetings, I specifically recall that the board agree on having meetings monthly. I don't have a clear understanding of what the minutes say. They seem to say that we agree on having the staff propose meetings. I, I'm, I'm not, it is not clear to me from the language. So if we could be revised to make it clear that we agreed on June 14th to have um, monthly meetings, um, I will appreciate that. Um, I don't have any other correction. There's a small um, incorrection in the future agenda items, but I don't think it's significant enough to um, bother to correct it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to collect these um, and then um, Mr. Phillips and I um, might ask some clarifying questions. Um, Ms. Sierra? Um, yes, good morning. I just have one, just a technical point. On page 15 in the first paragraph, um, when it talks about objections to the committee assignments, I believe it's just missing a no. There are no objections to the committee assignments. Ah, thank you. Um, Okay, um, any other um, comments or um, suggested edits to the meeting minutes? Great. Um, Mr. Phillips, um, let's maybe proceed in reverse order. Um, is there a no missing? Um, I know you listened to um, the recording to check. Um, I don't remember. We can go back and check. And yeah, right. So I took uh, contemporaneous notes at the last meeting, and then I went back and reviewed the uh, the tape or the, the video. Um, I believe that is correct. Uh, the technical um, issue with leaving out uh, no, there there were no objections uh, to what Miss uh, Sierra pointed out. Okay. Um, and um, then with regards to um, the final agenda item, um, Ms. De La Torre, um, Ms. De La Torre, is the correction 
the, the mention of staff. The monthly meetings is not a correction, correct? The correction is the mention of staff. Uh, I can pull up the... Um, I can share the screen. The, like. Right. So that is on page 17. And I think it is not clear that we agree on hosting and on having monthly meetings. I thought that both had been called on that, but it seems that it was not. But I do recollect um, very clearly that we agree that we will have monthly meetings. Uh, yes, I believe these minutes are accurate. Um, we did not vote, um, but we had a consensus and the meetings record that every person agrees. But what are we agreeing on, on having the staff schedule or on having meetings? Um, uh, I, I guess I'm unsure of the distinction. Right. So it isn't clear to me whether we are agreeing to host meetings or we are agreeing on asking the staff to propose meetings. My recollection is that we agreed on having meetings. Is that your recollection as, as well? Uh, I... Um, I with between the whether it was to staff to set a schedule or to have monthly meetings um i'm unsure mr phillips um are you do you do you recall again we can we can double check this um, i think I'm, the main point is that everybody agreed in principle and was in favor of having monthly meetings yeah i i, I can't recall exactly without reviewing um what the what the phrase was in that discussion, but the bottom line is the schedule is for monthly, the, the agreement was for monthly meetings, whether that's staff who sets it or whether it's chairperson Urban who uh, sets it. Um, I don't think that that's, um, that there's a distinction there. All right. Do you have an edit to propose, Ms. Delatory? Chairperson Urban proposed to have monthly meetings in monthly intervals due to the large amount of work to get done. That, that will make it clear. All right, well, I suspect that what is here is what actually was said, but I think the substance is the same. So um, thank you. Um, and then, on the, the CEA and chief deputy um, positions, I do recall, Ms. De La Torre, the, um, the portion of the minutes uh, with your comment. Could you remind me what page it is again? Um, the portion with my comment is on page six. And again, I do not have any concerns with making that position a CEA position. I think I made it clear through the meeting that I will prefer all uh, positions that are leadership positions to be CEA positions. All right. Um, so we will we will double check um, as to the as to what um, was said in the meeting. Um, uh, but I think you know we, as you will hear in future parts of the meeting. Um, I, the, again, the substance of the understanding seems to be fine because that's how we've been going. Um, all right, so I have um, several corrections proposed. One is um, there are no objections to the subcommittee um, assignments instead of objections. Uh, one is to edit the sentence on page 17, as Ms. Hela Torre and I just discussed, um, in order to remove the reference to staff um, which I do think is accurate, but this reflects the substance of our discussion. Um, and then Ms. De La Torre, do you want edits to this part or do you, um, are you suggesting edits or um, is it just important that we all understand that you support the CEA positions? So long as we have an understanding, it is okay, but I will appreciate if that could be noted um, somewhere, if not in the minutes 
um, they will be in the minutes of this meeting. Um, Mr. Phillips, is it perfect? Is it appropriate to put a note in these minutes, or should we just keep the minutes of this meeting? You can handle it either way. Um, you can make an official um, edit to last meeting's minutes right now and vote on that, um, or you can let this meeting's minutes reflect uh, the the understanding uh, okay. in, in a more clear way. Whatever is more expeditious works on my side. Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I propose that we make sure this is reflected in the minutes here um, uh, because I think that's most efficient. And then the last was um, with regard to the um, staggering, the natural staggering of the positions given the process to hire. Um, did you have a proposed edit to these minutes, Ms. De La Torre? Or again, would you like the understanding to be reflected either in the minutes today or in a, you know, an addendum note to, to the minutes from June 14th? No, it is perfect to reflect it in the minutes today. I think that what I want to make it make clear is that we agree that the positions will be posted as soon as possible and that they will not be staggered. All right, thank you. Um, we, will, we, we will reflect that in the minutes for today. Um, uh, and um, those were, that's the list that I had. Um, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, very minor edit on page 15. I'm sorry, I'll share my screen again. Go ahead. Uh, under agenda, agenda item six. Um, Thank you. Um, the, the notation where I talked about kind of the culture of an organization working remotely as an existing organization or a new mm -hmm. duty station, my recollection, those are two separate ideas. The way it's drafted, they flow together to be one. Um, so, I mean, it's a very minor edit, but uh, we were talking about working, I was talking about working remotely and how that works in a new organization versus one with an existing culture. And then the topic was the duty station listed on the job spec. Um, so, so if you look at the second sentence, he believes the board should be sensitive to that fact. I would just put a period after brand new entity and then uh, new sentence having a duty station, new sentence, new paragraph, having a duty station is a necessary piece of information for, there you go. How is that? Perfect, thank you. All right, um, of course, you're very welcome. Uh, any more um, uh, addenda or um, edits to the minutes? Wonderful, thank you all very much for your attention um, to the minutes and the careful read. Um, is there, um, are there any comments from members of the public? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. So uh, as a reminder, if anyone uh, from the public would like to make a comment, please press the raised hand icon on your screen. Uh, if you're joined by telephone only, you may press star nine to indicate that you'd like to comment. As a reminder, uh, you'll be called on and have up to three minutes maximum to make your comment. Uh, so we'll give just about um, 10 seconds or so to see if any hands come up. And it looks like we have uh, one comment. So let me, uh, it looks like the name is Barry Weber. We're able to unmute yourself and talk. Yes, thank you. This is Barry Weber. I was just wondering, I thought I'd recollected from the previous meeting also that we're gonna be monthly meetings. So I've just got this general question of what happened to meetings in July and August. Thank you for the comment, Mr. Weber. We will be taking up um, the meeting schedule um, in the next, probably in more than one agenda item. Um, Mr. Phillips will guide us as to what we can discuss. And I'm not seeing any more uh, public comments this time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Weber, and thank you to the board. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes as corrected per our discussion? 
um, and or as reflected in the minutes for today. Um, is someone on the board uh, ready to make a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. May I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, the board will now vote whether to approve the June 14th, 2021 board meeting minutes um, as amended in this discussion. Mr. Joseph Panera, will you please perform the roll call vote? Certainly, thank you. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? I approve. Ms. De La Torre approves. Mr. Lay? Yeah, approve. Mr. Lay, yes. Ms. Sierra? I approve. Ms. Sierra, yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mr. Thompson, yes. And Chairperson Urban? Yes. Thank you. We have a vote of 5 0. Thank you, uh, Mr. Joseph Panero. The motion carries, um, and the uh, finalized amended minutes will be posted uh, to the CPPA website um, as soon as we can get them corrected and um, remediated so that they are accessible for people with disabilities. All right, thanks everyone. Um, with that, we will move on to uh, agenda item number three, um, which is the chairperson's update. Um, this is something of a stand-in um, once we have an executive director, um, hopefully quite soon, um, then that person will be updating the board on activities between the meetings. I'm going to um, share some slides to facilitate our discussion. Um, and I'm going to walk through this um, uh, relatively quickly. I've tried to um, uh, strike the right balance. I don't know if it is between sort of detail, uh, too much detail and sufficient information um, for everyone to um, understand um, what, um, what I have to report. Um, and then we will um, have discussion. Uh, so with one, give me one moment to um, bring up the slides. Um, all right, so this is the chairperson's update for the September 7th and 8th, 2021 um, board meeting. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about the big picture um, and then uh, move through um, several points which um, are drawn from priorities the board identified in our June 14th meeting. Um, the big, I wanted to say a little bit just about um, the, the, big, the big, what I'm calling the big picture here. Um, as we know from the previous meeting um, and as everyone who is following this in the public and of course the board members know, we have two parallel efforts underway, each of which is very substantial. Um, one is substantial substantive work on a tight timeline, um, and the other is um, creating an agency. Um, when I talk to my clinic students, um, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the analogies that I use is from a fellow clinical professor um, that uh, in a situation like this, um, rather than flying the plane, you're jumping off the cliff and building the plane on the way down. Um, so we are in the midst of building this plane so that we can fly it um, to uh, regulations to give certainty and protection to the public um, and eventually enforcement. That means that there's a lot of things sort of happening in parallel um, and things that depend, uh, one thing depends on another um, that is a sort of in some ways unavoidable. So I'm going to explain kind of how we've been approaching it thus far um, so that we can, that we can discuss. Um, the focus has been on the infrastructure of the new agency, um, both abstract, um, by which I mean, um, uh, kind of, you know, figuring out the basic things that we can about how it will operate in the absence of the executive director um, and concrete um, contracts buildings, that kind of thing. Um, we are um, a state governmental agency. That means that um, multi-agency collaboration is required for most decisions and actions. This is very important to safeguard taxpayer money and to provide structure and transparency. There are numerous controls um, uh, around almost any activity, whether it is hiring, um, signing a contract, 
or um, uh, choosing a location as we discussed in the last board meeting. Um, so it's very important um, for everyone to have the picture in their mind that this is a governmental agency and that we are working in collaboration with our control, our control agencies and others in order to um, build things out. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Um, and I would like again to thank um, all the people um, at the um, DCA, um, the Department of General Services, BCSH, the Attorney General and others um, who are providing support. Um, uh, I wanted to bring up some the points of focus, which are um, from the last board meeting, um, what we discussed. Uh, Ms. Tiffany Garcia discussed um, the beginnings of contracted services. This is in my infrastructure bucket. Um, and that of course is important and has continued. Um, we had, as we alluded to in the last conversation, a discussion about how important it is um, to uh, develop staffing and personnel resources. It's just absolutely critical. Um, and the um, delegations um, that were made at the last meeting um, were for some leadership positions, except especially the executive director, um, the chief deputy director of administration. Um, we added the general counsel in the meeting um, and there are additional staff um, and services that are required um, to do anything from holding this meeting uh, to being able to actually interface with the control agencies to hire others, um, et cetera. We also talked about location and premises. Um, we uh, discussed um, some board policies and a handbook. Um, my understanding of that discussion uh, was that um, we agreed to work on this over time. Um, given the critical needs facing the agency. Um, and I'm happy, of course, to revisit that if we need to. Um, and of course, we split into subcommittees um, to do a fair amount of work. So one of the things about um, this update is that I will be referring to subcommittee um, updates that are coming um, imminently um, because um, a fair amount of information is likely to be in those. Um, to start with um, contracted services and infrastructure, um, this is, um, these are the services that are required um, to basically um, function and do things as an agency. Um, we've done most of this um, for the moment through what are called interagency agreements. Ms. Garcia um, mentioned these in the last meeting. She got several started um, and I completed um, some um, over the last um, few weeks. Um, some of them are still in progress, but they're um, they're essentially in place. We just have to um, finish the contract. Um, the first is um, an, uh, an IAA with the Office of the Attorney General. Um, they were providing, for example, human resources support through June 30th, um, at which point we moved to the Department of General Services, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, the Department of Consumer Affairs um, is providing information technology services for us. That includes email addresses, the website. Um, they built a list um, so that people could sign up for our announcements and that they're building um, a repository so we can accept comment from the public um, and that kind of thing. Um, it has an asterisk because um, uh, I, um, I expect the, the contract from them um, very soon, uh, but they have been uh, providing the work already. Uh, the Department of General Services um, is as it sounds. It is an agency that provides services to other agencies. We have several contracts with um, the Department of General Services. Um, the first is Human Resources Services. We transitioned to the Department of General Services on July 1st. Um, they have a um, series of teams um, who um, help us um, with um, all of the various steps that are required to hire different kinds of positions. There will be more detail about that in the startup administration subcommittee update. Um, the DGS is also, um, uh, we are working on contracted financial services and budget and planning. Um, these are services to do finance, budget and accounting. Um, this is not um, the person who is actually able to write the budget, um, but these are the people who are able to um, interface with the various um, control agencies um, and keep records for us. Um, in addition, um, we have um, uh, agreements with the Department of General Services for procurement services. We are not able to buy anything without procurement authority. 
Um, uh, DGS has recently started providing this service to a few agencies and they agreed to provide it to us. Uh, real estate services, which we will talk about in the Startup Administration Subcommittee in more detail. Um, and most importantly, um, and very happy news, um, we have an IAA with DGS um, as a loan, uh, part, a half loan, half time, excuse me, loan um, of a high level staff person uh, as our interim deputy director of administration. I will introduce her shortly. Um, we also have in place now um, uh, um, legal services from the Office of the Attorney General. Um, for this, um, I mean, their uh, government, excuse me, the Attorney General provides legal advice and services to other agencies in the state um, pursuant to um, a, um, a standard uh, a relationship and arrangement. Um, this is um, services that we can use to um, ask about various um, governmental issues um, and uh, other legal questions that come up for the agency. Um, and then there um, are some other services that are um, you know, less, um, less general. Um, uh, we are, um, the interim deputy director of administration is working hard on a transcription service for recordings. So we're able to make recordings accessible. Um, we are working through with procurement to get subscriptions um, to for our future job postings um, and um, some other things like that. Um, the second and related point of focus is staffing and personnel resources. This is critically important. Um, again, a lot of this update will be in the um, uh, Startup Administration Subcommittee report, but I did want to say a few words about the executive director, um, because that is something that um, happened before we began working on the rest of the positions. Excuse me. Just a moment. Um, but before we talk about that, um, I would like to um, very warmly welcome and introduce the Interim Chief Deputy Director of Administration, whom I mentioned. Um, her name is Deborah Castanon, um, and she is part of the um, webinar panel today. Um, she is the Chief Privacy Officer for DGS, um, and she has, and they have graciously agreed to give us 50% of her time um, to, um, to work on administrative matters while we are working to hire an executive director and other positions. Um, she was previously the Chief Privacy Officer for the California Department of Motor Vehicles, um, and she was um, one of the um, top two people in the California Office of Privacy Protection. Um, for those of you who are part of the privacy community, um, you know, that was a beloved office. Um, and Ms. Castanon has deep experience and expertise uh, and commitment um, to the work of the agency. We are very grateful um, to have her. She is currently our only staff member. Um, and again, we will be talking about um, uh, where we are in efforts to um, increase um, staff in the um, Startup Administration Subcommittee uh, report. Um, so the executive director position. Um, I, um, I was very grateful um, to all the members of the board for the robust discussion and the approval to move ahead with this, to delegate the authority to me to sign the paperwork um, and move ahead with this. Um, I agreed with and um, I heard and I absolutely agreed with the urgency. Um, I thought um, because we had had an initial approval from Cal HR, the human resources um, team, that I would be able to post it probably that week. Um, I was incorrect and I just wanted to share why I was incorrect with the board um, because this um, and for the public, this is not something we can kind of talk about offline. Um, Bagley Keen requires us to talk about it in public. And um, so I apologize if it is sort of boring, um, but I thought it was important to understand the sort of the collaboration um, that is required um, and necessarily required to safeguard public money um, in order to make a move like this. Um, so there was an exempt pay request um, which went, which is a several page document with a justification and essay that went into CalHR two days after the board meeting. Um, 
a, a staff person at um, uh, the attorney general's office who was helping us with HR, followed up every week, sometimes more than once a week. Um, we transitioned to the DGS HR team on July 1st, um, but um, the person in attorney general's office and I thank her, I don't wanna name her because I haven't asked permission, but I'm very grateful to her, continued to shepherd the package. We received the approval, which is called an exempt pay letter on July 7th. At that point, we needed to do um, other things. We needed to establish the position number and generate what's called a 607 in order to request Department of Finance approval. Um, all of that work was done um, and Department of Finance approval was requested on July 14th. That usually takes 30 days. Um, Department of Finance expedited this for us quite substantially. Um, and in the interim, we also made some other requests. Um, we needed a code from the state controller's office and some other things. And we finally got all of the approvals required um, on July 27th and 28th um, and had to be established in the Cal Career System because we didn't exist yet. And the job was posted on July 28th. Um, there's a 30 day posting period, um, which was, that was a choice that I made um, uh, in order to give people sufficient time to apply. Um, other kinds of positions have some requirements, but we could choose different things for this position. I chose the 30 day posting period, which closed on August 29th. Um, the applications arrived last Monday um, and they are currently under review. So thank you for indulging this. I just had the sense and I know that people must have been curious um, about the steps. And so I hope this is somewhat helpful. It is not all of the, it's not all of it, um, but um, it's a little bit more detail um, than, um, than just you know, saying that we needed approvals. Um, and then um, there's been uh, quite a lot of activity on the CEA positions um, and working towards civil service positions, which again, we will talk about um, in the startup and administration subcommittee. Location and premises was another point of focus for our meeting on June 14th. Um, that, um, again, we will bring up in the startup administration subcommittee. Um, and the policies and handbook, again, um, my understanding was we were gonna work on that over time, um, but I, um, I certainly welcome um, uh, other priorities from board members in discussion. Uh, and finally, subcommittee work, which I understand has been ongoing. Um, I have a few additional updates. Um, the conflict of interest policy we voted on last time is out for public comment. It's a 45 day period, which ends September 20th. Um, so I will be finding out if we need to vote on it again, um, and we will vote on it in the next board meeting um, if we do. Um, I would like to acknowledge and recognize that Mr. Lay mentioned strategic planning in the last board meeting, um, and that is still on the list. Um, the notice to the attorney general um, for us to take authority, um, to accept authority to begin rulemaking is not on the agenda for today. Um, we do have um, a, a busy agenda um, and we have a little bit of time to do that, but it is very much a priority and is on the list. Um, uh, communications, uh, I mentioned the distribution list. Um, we are working um, to get recordings of the meetings onto the website. Um, I am hoping that this will happen now very quickly. Um, and I apologize if you have been looking for the recording, they do need to be transcribed. Um, and um, we are working on that. Um, and uh, we have dates um, set for the next two board meetings, Monday, October 18th and Monday, November 15th. Um, but I have put in brackets um, the fact um, that we may need additional, mostly closed sessions for hiring. Mr. Thompson um, uh, made this very good point in the last meeting um, and asked if, that, if it was possible to do this. Um, it is, um, every meeting is noticed, public meeting, then we can go into closed session if we need to discuss candidates and don't have other agenda items for the day um, uh, and come back out of closed session. So um, those are in brackets um, because I anticipate that we may need um, those. Um, and um, subcommittee reports, again, will have further information and advice. The subcommittees that I am on, I know um, we have um, we have some um, advice. We have some advice um, that 
will certainly involve uh, additional public events and meetings. Um, the priorities in my view are three. The first is people. Um, Ms. Castanon um, is, been a real, is, a, is a real boon to the agency. Um, we, um, we have to hire staff. I know the board knows this um, and we talked about in the last meeting, that is a big priority. Um, we've come up with some various strategies um, for temporary options um, and we will talk about those in the uh, startup and administration subcommittee meeting. The second is systems. Um, unlike a, a business, uh, there is no um, secretary of state for a new agency. Um, uh, there's no sort of checkbox or services. Um, uh, so building the systems that allow us to operate um, is crucial. Um, and of course, substance, um, making progress on the substance. Um, my view is that um, all of this, we need to get as far as we can and set the stage um, for the executive director. Um, I've been trying to avoid making decisions that the executive director should make, um, but we are on such a tight timeline. Um, and the timeframes for creating the systems and hiring people are such uh, that I think naturally um, the best that we can do and the right thing to do is to set everything up so the executive director um, is able to, to walk in and finish the processes. And if we get uh, some of these processes done before the executive director arrives, um, uh, that is all too better. So um, our current challenges um, are um, that we do have these parallel activities that have to happen. Um, in, they, they have to happen in parallel and that are on a very tight timeline. Um, and we um, are working hard um, to develop staffing, um, but we are very limited in staff. Um, so uh, with this, I would like to return to Mr. Weber's comment. Um, and we can talk about this more in the discussion. Um, there are two reasons why we didn't have a meeting in July um, or in August. Um, the first was simply um, that a fundamental reason for the next meeting um, was to discuss the executive director. Um, and this is the absolute earliest that we could do that. However, um, the other reason is that we are borrowing staff um, for every meeting. Um, and I have secured staff for um, the next two meetings um, and we are developing a plan um, for further staffing we are working um, to be able to um, have a steady, um, steady plan, um, but there have been some, some challenges. And so the final, the final issue that I like to discuss is what everybody um, can do to help. Um, for the public, um, we would like you to uh, continue to be engaged and we very much appreciate that. Um, when we begin our preliminary activities, we very much want to, uh, for rulemaking, we very much want to hear from you, hear what your views are on what the regulations should say. That would be, it's always valuable. It will be particularly valuable um, in the current situation. Um, for board members, um, I know that you have been giving a lot in a volunteer position, um, a lot of time, a lot of resources, um, and um, I will continue to ask you to do that for what I hope is a relatively um, limited period of time. Um, and um, again, I just want to give a very big thanks to all of the um, staff people who sort of loaned their time to us in order to make um, these initial things happen so that we can um, move forward um, on our own footing. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up for um, discussion. Um, in order to um, frame the discussion, um, uh, um, I would like to note again that we do have two more or three, we have three more subcommittee presentations coming um, and there may be a fuller picture of sort of resources and activities by the end of that. Um, so I may suggest that we um, recall the item um, in order to come back to it, if that makes sense. But in any case, um, uh, would the board like to comment, ask questions? Please raise your hand.
Ms. De La Torre. Um, I just want to start by thanking you for all of the commitment that you have made to the agency. Um, it is something that I think goes underappreciated in many ways. Um, so obviously all of the stuff that you mentioned as well, but um, thank you, Mrs. Urban, for the commitment that you have made. I just lost, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, I lost my video. I'm Okay, <laughs> no, no problem. So I, I wanted to start by thanking you. I also um, wanted to mention that the slide that you prepare on the process for the executive director was very, very helpful to give us a visual of all of the steps, which are not intuitive to me. And I imagine they are not intuitive to the public necessarily, um, so that we can better understand the challenge that we are facing. Um, I also wanna mention that I appreciate that we have um, set a certain time for the meetings in October and November. I remain concerned about our ability to sufficiently meet. I understand that that might not be something that we wanna discuss at this point, but I think it will be helpful for the board to talk about it so that we can collaborate in supporting you and supporting the staff in finding solutions so that we can meet our um, deadlines. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, that, is that is much appreciated. Um, I do think that it would probably be helpful to work through all the subcommittee reports so that we understand everything that's on the table, both in terms of resources that we're developing and the needs that we have. And then I would propose that we recall this um, agenda item uh, in order to talk about planning and resources um, in the sort of near and medium um, term. And I would like to ask Mr. Phillips if that is acceptable, um, if that would be an acceptable process to follow. Um, could you repeat the, uh, so I'm clear. So on what you're asking. I understood that Ms. Ms. De La Torre um, was asking to have a deeper discussion um, about resources for meetings and scheduling meetings. I apologize, Mr. Torre. I know that I know that I'm paraphrasing you, um, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong. That um, is perfect. It's better than. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was wondering if the appropriate approach would be um, to go. We, we talk about all of the subcommittee work, which will flesh this out more, and then recall this item. Um, or if it would be better to discuss it um, under another item. Um, I regret that um, in the last meeting, I had a specific agenda item for meeting schedule and I neglected to add it to this one. Um, but uh, of course, I, um, meeting schedules are a topic of, of this um, presentation. Um, and so it seemed to me that we could recall this, um, but if there's another point that would be better um, we would um, be grateful to know. Yeah, I think uh, based on the agenda, this would probably be the most appropriate um, agenda item to discuss, to have that discussion under. Um, future agenda items would also uh, uh, kind of work, but I think um, because this question was raised here, recalling it after uh, the more substantive subcommittee uh, uh, agenda items is, is probably your most appropriate approach. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, that that um, uh, gives me an idea as well that maybe we would like to recall it after future agenda items so that we have a full picture and then we can recall it. But um, uh, it, I assume that would be just as appropriate and um, we can um, sort of see where we are um, after we hear from the subcommittees. Yes, and you, you certainly have the latitude to jump around in the agenda um, as long as you know it, it's for good purposes and not to try and stifle public comment or participation in any way. Right, of course, yeah. Um, uh, and in order to make it as easy as possible for the public um, to participate, um, I think it will be helpful to follow the order as much as we can. Um, and I am now um, letting everybody know that we will recall this item later in the day um, after we have more information so that everyone in the public is aware 
of where the discussion is going and can plan accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Further um, comments or questions from the board? Thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, is there public comment from anybody in the audience? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, as a reminder, if anyone would like to make a public comment, uh, please press the raised hand on your screen. Or if you're connected by telephone only, you can press star nine. And it looks like we do have uh, one comment initially. Uh, Barry Weber. You have three minutes. I'll only take a couple of seconds. I just wanted to thank all of you for what you're doing. I think this is an incredibly difficult situation. It's clear that you are doing an admirable job at navigating all sorts of things that are happening in different directions and the limitations of the public open meetings and so forth. I just want to commend you on what you're doing and look forward to future uh, output for the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there further public comment? I see no additional public comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre and the rest of the members of the board. We will recall this um, item in order to um, have a discussion about resources um, and meetings and other public events, I think, um, uh, later in the day. With that, um, I would like to move to agenda item number four, which is an update um, and a recommendation from the start of the administration subcommittee. As a brief reminder, our last board meeting, we formed uh, three advisory subcommittees, which we'll be reporting today. Uh, Bagley Keene allows for sub excuse me, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act allows for subcommittees of two people for a board of our size. Um, uh, to act in advisory capacity for the board. And the startup and administration subcommittee uh, is made up of Ms. Angela Sierra and myself. Um, we have a um, brief presentation um, uh, in order to um, provide an update. And then we will uh, engage in discussion. Um, and um, uh, we have one action item that we have proposed. Ms. Sierra, um, if uh, with uh, if you agree, I will go ahead and pull up the presentation. Great. Thank right. you. Is this the um, Startup Administration Subcommittee update? Is that what everyone sees? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, uh, 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 again, Angela, Sierra, and I are the um, members of the administration um, and, excuse me, Startup and Administration Subcommittee. Um, the roadmap um, for our discussion today um, is that we'll first do an update of our activities um, generally um, very brief, um, and uh, discuss the office space and location um, work that we've been doing. Uh, we will then talk about continuing hiring strategy positions and timelines. Um, this is the um, further information in detail that I mentioned um, under the last agenda item. Um, uh, and um, we will finally um, discuss um, selected board and agency policies and practices. We have one policy to consider as a board, um, and we would like to have some discussion about prioritizing, how to prioritize work for policies for the board um, while we are undertaking um, all of these various um, activities. With that, um, the Startup and Administration Subcommittee um, has been operating since the end of the last meeting. Um, we have taken as our priorities the same list that I mentioned in my um, chairperson's update um, uh, covering whatever is within the remit um, of the start of the administration subcommittee. Uh, we have focused um, largely on hiring, um, on space, um, and on selecting policies. Uh, um, uh, and um, we, of course, welcome additional priorities from the board. Um, with that, um, I will um, turn it over 
to Ms. Uh, Sierra for the first um, of our updates, which is on office space and location. Okay. Thank you so much, Chair Urban. And good morning, everyone. So I'm going to give a um, kind of high level overview of the work that the Startup and Administration Subcommittee has been doing with respect to the issue of office space and geographic location. Um, so as Chair Urban noted, one of our subcommittee priorities has been to explore and, and obtain options for our agency to obtain um, office space, um, at least initial office space as we are moving forward for employees that will be soon hopefully be joining our agency. Um, to pursue this, we have done a number of things. Um, one is we've been in consultation with various agencies. Um, for example, we have been working now very closely on seeking advice and services from the Dep Department of General Services, DGS. Um, as Chair Urban noted um, earlier, um, DGS has a unit within it that focuses on um, real estate and facilities, services, and support for state agencies such as ours. And they've been doing this for a long time, and um, they've been able to give us a lot of guidance um, and support. We've also been consulting with our business, consumer services, and housing agency, um, in that they are the umbrella agency for many um, state agencies or departments and are aware of potential space that is available now or maybe um, available in the near future. Um, also in doing the work on this topic, um, we have been um, working with these agencies and working among ourselves to do um, and prepare and develop estimates of what our potential office needs are. And um, we are working on these estimates with a view that um, we're gonna need lots of flexibility. We want to um, think both in the short term and long term, but we are trying to devise a plan in which once we have an executive director on board, they will have the flexibility to kind of re refine these estimates and plans. But we need some initial ideas about approximately like over the next six, nine, 12 months, approximately how many offices we would need, for example. Would we need conference rooms? Would we need cubicles generally? Um, would we need an area, for example, for um, some support staff, you know, or for, um, you know, a, you know a, an entryway or security for our building or for our office? So um, the folks at um, Department of General Services, they've been really terrific. Um, in talking through this with them and based on our um, conversation at the last board meeting, um, it was our view that we should start with one geographic area first and um, from our conversation to the last board meeting, um, there seemed to be a general consensus that we would at a minimum have um, a footprint and have some office space or should have some office space in Sacramento being that was a center of state government, um, there would be, if we had staff there, they would be close to the legislature, to the governor's office, to one of our main offices at the office of the attorney general, um, et cetera. Um, and it made sense in working with DGS to focus on one geographic area at a time. And so um, they have been working with us to explore what may be available um, in terms of state owned facilities. Um, it was their advice, and um, we agreed with it, that if we were able to find some office space in a state-owned building, that would provide us more flexibility and would likely be less costly um, than if we were to um, look for and obtain space in a privately owned building. If we cannot find sufficient um, or a satisfactory um, office space in a state-owned facility, then they will work with us in looking for space in a private facility. Um, we are in somewhat parallel tracks looking for both a short-term home that perhaps typically, you know, in, in state government for state agencies, that might be like a home, a, a, a core office for approximately, you know, six to 12 months. And then at the same time doing some work and looking at what may be 
um, available for a longer term home. Again, just in terms of options for our executive director. Uh, so working on those two tracks, um, but focus primarily on what could be a short term home for our agency. Um, I wanted just to let you know the factors that we as a subcommittee um, are really focusing on and will be incorporating um, when we are providing these um, options to the executive director. Um, we wanna make sure we have a, a sufficient space that the floor plan makes sense for the activities that our agency will be engaged in. Um, of course, we're gonna be looking and comparing cost. You know, that will be not only the rent, but will we have to do any remodeling to the space? Um, some state agencies have space available that they've left that may be available that are already furnished. Some are not, and we'll be taking that into account as to part of the cost. Um, looking at the precise location, looking at whether parking will be available. Um, and most importantly, um, particularly um, with this short-term home is what are the terms of the agreement that is going to be a, that we can negotiate? What will be the length? And very importantly, will we have flexibility to end the agreement when we determine as an agency that we're ready to move on to a different location? Um, and another thing I just wanted to note is that while we're focusing on Sacramento, that will not um, exclude us from down the road. Um, looking for property in other locations. Uh, but we were told that um, with respect to metropolitan areas, um, facility space in Sacramento will likely be less expensive than other uh, metropolitan areas in California, just as a generality. Okay. So next steps and where we're at, um, we have uh, three potential facilities have been identified that are available um, currently. And so, and that look like they may meet the needs that we feel um, are appropriate at this time. Um, would give us some office space for executives in our office. We would have cubicles, for example, for um, other staff. It would provide a conference room for our agency, et cetera. There's gonna be a walkthrough of two of the potential Sacramento facilities in um, later this month in mid-September. Um, at that walkthrough, it will be uh, representatives of DGS. Again, they are the ones who have um, identified um, these facilities and provided us with the floor plans and some information about them. And then along with them will be um, Deborah Castanon, our interim deputy director for administration. And then she'll be able to come back and report to our subcommittee as to um, what she found with these walkthroughs and her thoughts on this. And then there's also um, gonna be an evaluation of some additional, additional office space that had been currently used or had been used recently by the Department of Consumer Affairs or maybe other state agencies um, that may be available and we'll be able to follow up on as well. So as a, after this exploration and these walkthroughs and when options solidify, um, there will be a report to our executive director if we have one on board at that, at that point. Um, if not, um, we will bring a report to this board. If we do have an executive director at that point, um, we anticipate that the executive director will be reporting to our board um, just to get our input um, and comments about this. And then ultimately, um, when a decision is made, um, we will be entering into, it will be called either a space allocation agreement or an interagency agreement, assuming that we are, um, if they have found appropriate space, space in a state-owned facility. So that is the end of my report. And again, I just wanted to kind of give you kind of an overview of what, we're, what we have been doing and where we are at on this issue. But, uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just add that um, to give the board um, and, and the public um, a sort of a general sense, um, the the prices are not 100% clear yet, um, but they've been somewhere between um, like a dollar fifty and three dollars a square foot. Um, the spaces that um, have been suggested so far, identified so far as potentials have furniture. Um, they're not, it's not necessarily um, exactly what we need, 
Um, so there may be some additional need to move things around or change things a bit, um, but that's kind of the, the DGS um, uh, um, real estate team um, is looking for plug and play is what, is what they called it, um, that can be um, used um, until a longer term solution is found. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Sierra. You know, and I just wanna add one thing um, and I just, I think I, I'm not sure if I emphasize this, the um, staff at the Department of General Services have been, they have really understand our need for flexibility and are providing a lot of guidance on how an agency deals with this as they're gonna be growing over time. So that has been really appreciated. Thank you. Um, all right, um, so my hope is that we will give all of our updates and then have discussion. Um, if you have a burning question though, um, please, um, board members, do raise your hand. I, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see all raised hands at once, um, but I will keep scanning um, and hope that I don't miss anyone. The second update is the critical um, hiring and personnel uh, resources update. Uh, I mentioned, I talked a little bit in the um, chairperson's report about the executive director. Um, and um, this is the work that we've been doing on all of the other positions. Um, Mr. Thompson, I see your hand. Um, sorry, you had asked that we go through the whole presentation and then ask questions. Okay. That, um, that yes, that, I think that's most efficient, but if okay. we can also pause after topics, if, if, you, if you fear you might lose your question or point, for example. Thank you for, I, I fear that my short attention span is gonna, <laughs> inhibit my ability to hold, I, I'm making notes, but um, I don't know if we lose the flow of each topic because there's a lot in this in this topic. Um, Do you have a comment or question on the real estate topic? I have a couple, um, but I don't know if others want to go topic by topic and have the discussion or well, if that's okay with you, chairperson. Sure, why don't we just suggest um, and uh, try to have a relatively efficient conversation um, to make sure no one loses anything and we can always circle back as well. Um, so um, please go ahead, Mr. Thompson. One question and apologies if it was mentioned and I didn't catch it. Uh, as far as the government owned space or leased space, if, if one is faster to occupancy um, or if it's case by case, because obviously speed is, is essential here. Um, yes, my understanding is that um, the government owned space is much faster to occupancy um, for a couple of reasons. One is privately leased space usually requires a significant amount of, um, uh, of um, uh, um, customization. Um, but secondly, there's the um, leasing and contracting process. Um, the third issue, which is not one you brought up, Mr. Thompson, but which has animated um, mine and Ms. Sierra's um, approach thus far, is that commercial leases usually lock you in for quite a while. Um, and the um, state options, um, there is the possibility of agreeing um, in advance um, that this could be a short-term solution so that we could move on um, as we as we grow. Okay. Um, those are the that was the advice that we got from DGS um, residential ResD. Um, and uh, we did think that it was good advice. Sounds good. My only thought was that given the it seems like at least in LA where I am, there's a high vacancy rate in commercial space right now because of COVID. And I didn't know if we could get additional flexibility either on price or accommodation for our needs from a commercial landlord at this point, um, because they would want the stability of our business. But as you said, we need some flexibility as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Thompson. That's a very good point. There's also more availability in state-owned space than there has been previously for um, similar reasons. There's more remote work, so space is opening up. Um, uh, of course, that applies to commercial real estate as well. Um, and it's not it's certainly an option that is open. Um, uh, for the short term, we were focusing on the state owned option, um, but we certainly will continue to ask them about that. And my assumption is the executive director um, we hire um, will have, um, will report to us with sort of a vision and a plan 
um, for the longer term. Uh, Mr. Lay. Yeah, I had a quick question is around uh, what's the approximate square footage or the number of people that um, you're, you're trying to accommodate in, in looking for these spaces? And then my other question is, you know, um, you gave a dollar price for square footage, but what is kind of like the, the anticipated budget for like a 12 month spot? Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. Sierra, I, we do have those numbers and... Yeah. So I, I have I have the square footage for two of the um, spaces that we'll be looking at in um, mid um, September, and one is um, approximately forty three hundred square feet, and the other is much larger, is ten thousand square feet. Um, it's probably more than we may need it early on. We were. In, in our evaluation at this point, but that part, that space may be able to be broken out. And in terms of a short-term um, amounts of offices right now, um, again, we're only looking for office space for employees, um, not board members, but we um, are hoping to have like a conference room or a office that board members could use on occasion if they wish to. Um, but right now, just for initial purposes, we're looking at three or four actual offices within, you know, maybe six or so or more cubicles um, in the area for a conference room because we are going to imagine that, you know, meetings may be happening and we're also need space um, for interviews. Um, we were looking for in a uh, space for receptionist um, and also a space office or just a allocated space for, um, you know, IT services that we are going to have and equipment, things of that nature. Thank you. I would, I would say, Mr. Lay, I would hesitate on the dollar numbers um, just because we have kind of, we've gotten some sort of basic information, um, but without having seen what the offer is. Uh, I don't want to um, misspeak. Uh, you know, there may be other charges that we don't know about, um, but depending on the size, um, back of the envelope, it's around $12,000 a month um, and up depending if it's bigger space. Okay, appreciate that. If, if, you, if you promise not to um, take that. I, I won't hold you to it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thompson. You're on mute, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the time. My other question was the bullet about uh, next steps report to the executive director and or board when options solidify. Uh, is there a thinking that we would delegate the decision on the office to the executive director, assuming they're on board, or is this going to, will there be an opportunity for the board to weigh in on this decision? My, my view, preference would be that the board have the opportunity to weigh in on that. Um, thank you. Uh, my view is that that is up to the board. Um, we could delegate this on the executive director. Um, I thank you for your view. Uh, my own view is that for temporary space, um, I would I would ask the executive director to make the best decision within some range of price. Um, but I absolutely understand um, your point of view, Mr. Thompson, um, and I think it's really a question for the board collectively. We won't sign any leases without talking to the board. <laughs> Unless you tell us to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess it also it depends on the duration. So you, you raise yeah. a good point about the temporary nature. Yeah. All right. Um, if there's nothing else at the moment on this topic, and we can circle back if something occurs to you, I will move on to the second um, chunk of our updates, uh, which is the um, crucial hiring and personnel resources um, update. Uh, well, it's a crucial issue. I don't. Um, we've um, uh, the um, uh, we've been working on a number of different fronts um, simultaneously uh, in order to try to provide some basic staffing um, and or the, um, the sort of um, already teed up um, package for the executive director to make decisions between people on um, uh, as we, uh, over the last couple of months. So as an overall um, 
overall update and um, uh, illumination of the strategy we've been following. Uh, we've had two concurrent goals. One is to establish leadership positions, uh, which we discussed in the board meeting last time. Um, and the second is to find a way to establish sufficient staffing to accomplish immediate needs. Um, that includes hiring, actually. Um, we do not have um, a human resources analyst, um, the person who prepares the duty statements and the packages um, that then can go to DGSHR um, for processing, for obtaining approvals and that sort of thing. Um, uh, right now, um, I have been preparing those, Ms. Sierra, um, has been preparing some and she's been an incredible help. I should have started this entire presentation with my deep gratitude to Ms. Sierra for all the work that she's been doing. Um, so that that would be an example of a staff position that would be um, really helpful to have right away. Um, rulemaking, of course, um, and I will defer some of that discussion to um, the regulation subcommittee discussion because the regulation subcommittee has been considering that um, closely. Um, and um, underlying functions, uh, the website, um, IT, um, being able to hold meetings, um, getting legal advice, um, which is why we put in place the uh, relationship with the Attorney General's office, being able to produce a budget um, and keep track of our finances, all of these things. Um, a lot of those we have we have the um, processing services in place from DGS and they've been incredibly wonderful and been holding our hand. Um, but um, having a professional staff who know how this works um, would help um, a lot and is critical in the short to medium term. Um, along with that, um, we have tried to balance maintaining some flexibility for future leadership. Um, in the last boarding meeting, we discussed that at least for some positions, it will be important um, for leadership to know that they can work with the people um, who are staff um, while meeting immediate needs. Um, and what we found is the hiring process naturally dictates this um, uh, because um, of the way the process, the, the steps of the process, it tends to stagger things um, sufficiently that I think most of the time leadership will be able to have some say. Um, so I walk through the various option sets for um, the board's illumination um, and then explain how we've um, tried to take advantage of each one. Um, the first, of course, are exempt positions. Uh, for us, we have the executive director and the chief privacy auditor. Those positions are in the statute, so we can um, hire as an exempt position. These uh, positions are at will. They serve at the pleasure of the board. There is quite a lot of flexibility for the position characteristics. Um, it's somewhat less complicated process to hire. Um, despite the steps that I showed you, um, it's somewhat less complicated. There are a fair number of approvals um, that are required. Um, and there are some basic steps that have to happen. You have to have the position administratively established. Salary range has to be justified, um, uh, um, et cetera. But that's the first batch, um, and we have two. The second batch um, are the career executive assignment positions that Ms. Garcia mentioned in our last board meeting, and Ms. Um, De La Torre mentioned um, under the last agenda item. Um, we are currently um, pursuing two, the Chief Deputy Director of Administration and the General Counsel. These positions are at will. They are reserved for leadership positions with policy responsibility. I put that in quotes because um, uh, that uh, generally means uh, policy within the organization. They're the ones who set um, you know, the course of the division um, or that sort of thing, but it can also mean exterior policy responsibility. Um, it is a more complicated process. Um, we have a choice of three classifications. Um, there's a, something called a concept package that has to be prepared and submitted to CalHR for approval. It's about 25 to 30 pages long, and it includes a lot of explanation uh, for why um, this position is justified. Um, simultaneously, um, it's required to seek Department of Finance approval for the salary. Um, there's a review by CalHR. They often will um, have questions. Um, uh, eventually, um, when they approve it, it gets posted for public comment for 30 days. Um, after 30 days, CalHR reviews again. Um, if it approves, then an exam can be created and the job posted. Uh, these jobs require what's called an exam um, in California state government. 
um, it's, it's usually answering a series of questions or meeting a series of um, required um, experience characteristics. There is an exam team at DGSHR that is helping us with that. And then once the candidate is selected, there's um, a cast, there's a list of, of further approvals um, before an offer is made, but it's a, it's a shorter list. The third is permanent position, a third permanent position option set, excuse me, um, are civil service positions. These are, this will be most of our positions. Um, each position has to be administratively established. Overall budget approval is required. We will not need individual budget approval for all positions, unlike the CEAs and the exempt positions. Um, it depends on the salary. Um, there are a set of available classifications and the job classification must be chosen from that set. Um, it is possible to request a new job classification. It is a lengthy process. Um, there's a wide range of classifications available across the state government. Sometimes an agency will sort of have ownership over a series of classifications um, and you need to request permission to use that classification or make a new classification. Um, but in any case, a, an appropriate classification must be found. Um, and then when that, once that happens for existing classifications, there's already a standard exam um, for that position. I'll say a little bit more about that, about this in a moment, um, but that's sort of basic for the um, civil service positions. Then there are temporary staffing positions. Um, we discussed this in the last board meeting, um, what the options might be. Um, the first is the interagency agreement that um, Ms. Castanon um, comes to us under. That's loan of staff from one department agency to another. There is process, of course, in developing the contract, um, and it requires um, various services um, to be in play, but it is the most efficient option that we've discovered. The major limiting factor we've run into is the profound lack of available staff to borrow from other agencies. Agencies are currently very thinly staffed, um, and it's been very difficult um, to find, um, uh, to find um, people to um, work for us under an interagency agreement. There's also retired, the retired annuitant um, classification. Uh, state retirees can return part-time up to 50% in a fiscal year on a time-limited contract. Um, Ms. Sierra and I think that this is a, has high potential for um, us to be able to get help from experienced staff. Um, it doesn't require posting the position, you can, um, but there's a database called Boomerang where um, state retirees who are interested in positions um, post um, and you can review and reach out to them. It also requires a concept and justification and paperwork. It's somewhat different process um, and usually um, an internal approval um, rather than the series of approvals. Finally, there is the option of contractors. Um, it also requires justification and approval, usually an open bidding process and procurement. Um, after exploring it um, to some degree, we are not pursuing this option right now. Um, we will happily take feedback. Um, it is a relatively lengthy process again, but we will if it's viable for a particular position or need. Um, so those are the sort of the panoply of options as we understand them. The state of our current efforts is um, of course, the interim chief deputy director of administration was on boarded through an IAA um, on August 1st. She's with us for 50% time through October 31st. Um, we may be able to extend her time, be nice to her, please. Um, if you run into her boss at DGS, be nice to her boss at DGS. Um, uh, currently, the contract is through October 31st. The chief deputy director of administration, the concept, DEA concept was prepared and submitted in July, mid-July, I didn't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't put the exact dates on, on this one. Um, again, balancing how much information, um, but where we are is we got the initial approval. It was posted um, for 30-day comments. Um, the 30-day period ended last week, August 30th. Um, you then wait for another approval. CalHR was really quick with it. They, everybody is trying to help us as much as they can, and they approved on August 30th. DOF really outdid itself, and that's, excuse me, the Department of Finance, and approved it on September 3rd. 
Um, and so we are currently awaiting state controller approval, reviewing delegation agreements, um, which I need to review with council, um, working to create the exam, prepare what's called a job control part report from which the posting is created um, and create the posting. The general counsel, um, this is also, it's a little bit behind the chief deputy director of administration, um, uh, the steps up to the posting for public comments have been completed. Um, it is currently in its 30 day public comment period, which expires September 22nd. The chief privacy auditor um, is um, something that we would like to have board um, discussion about. Um, we would like to prepare this package and um, send it, get it in for approval as soon as possible. Uh, but we were hoping to give board input on the characteristics um, of this position. And we have room for that a little bit later in the discussion. Um, we are, uh, for temporary positions, um, we are looking out for interagency agreement options. Um, I didn't put that on there. As I said, it's been hard to find, but we have our ear to the ground. Um, retired annuitants, um, we have several experienced attorneys. Um, we are looking to hire on a temporary part-time basis. Um, they each have experience with rulemaking or other things that are relevant to our work. Um, we are currently working on HR packages and approvals. Um, sometimes, you know, um, a position will not quite work out because we can't get the classifications to match um, or something like that. But um, we are hoping to have um, several um, retired annuitant um, uh, uh, staff um, quite soon. Ms. Sierra, um, I, um, I confess I, um, I've lost track of exactly how many. Ah. Okay. Oh, good. I'm unmuted. Um, yes, we are. Sorry about that. Um, right now in conversations and working on potential approvals for approximately five. Um, right. Okay. And these are attorneys. Um, uh, Ms. Castanon is also reviewing administrative professionals um, for high level positions to um, help with the administrative work um, currently. Finally, are the are the general, the, the civil service positions. Um, again, this is a new process. Um, we are a little in earlier stages of this, um, but we've met with the appropriate team at DGS last week and gotten the sort of training. Um, we do have some um, very draft duty statements. Um, they are looking out for other duty statements that we can repurpose. They're going to review comparable agencies and advise us on an initial position set. Um, and we have identified a few high need initial classifications, um, uh, like the high liaison I mentioned, a budget analyst is going to be um, important soon. Um, and there's a position called an AGPA um, that um, hopefully the Ms. Sierra knows from being working in state government, that sounds like an almost magical position to me, um, just very experienced, effective people, basically. Yes, yes, and I'll just you know, note that um, in, in my experience, it, there is a um, broad range of different types of work an AGPA um, can do. Um, in my experience, as the chair been noted, can be really critical and helpful to a team, whether it's policy work, um, paralegal work, other um, just support work that can be done. So. I've been very, um, very much in support of pursuing that um, option down the road. And can you help me with the initialism? Oh boy! I know career assistant governmental. I will. I will come back to you on that because I am so I used to calling them APPAs. <laughs> um, uh, so the next steps um, that we advise that we continue are to continue the efforts with the rich side annuitants and keep our ear to the ground for. Um, interagency agreement um, opportunities to keep pushing through the process for the CEA positions um, and to pursue initial civil service positions. Um, we, there is also um, uh, um, 
the um, Office of the Attorney General is providing regular legal services to us. We've transitioned from their HR department to DGS, as I mentioned, um, for sort of a more medium term um, uh, solution. Um, and there is um, further news on that, which I think will be discussed in the regulations subcommittee. Um, but our goal has been to establish the processes, establish the agency and the uh, various systems in the state um, and to make significant progress for the executive director. Um, in some, we're trying to move as quickly as we can um, while um, making sure that we are following all the processes that are required um, and um, giving room to the executive director to hire staff. And I'll just note that board member Vincent Lay, thank you. He has for the acronym is the Associate Governmental Program Analyst. Thank you. Thank Adrian. you, Mr. Lay. I, <laughs> I don't know why I, I, I just, they well, just. No, I, I should know that, but I well, uh, had a brain uh, freeze. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra and Mr. Lay. Um, so on the Chief Privacy Auditor position, um, the, stat, the um, Proposition 24 um, now, um, part of the California Privacy Protection Act um, says that, excuse me, the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, that says that the California Privacy Protection Agency shall appoint a chief privacy auditor to conduct audits of businesses to ensure compliance with this title pursuant to regulations um, adopted by the agency. Um, it's in the statute, so this is an exempt position. Um, we have been working on a duty statement for CalHR with the goal to post the position as soon as possible. Um, we, this is not, um, as, I, as I understand the sort of purpose behind the Chief Privacy Auditor, um, the, the, the thought um, that the drafters of the law had was that the Chief Privacy Auditor um, would be um, the head of enforcement. Um, we don't necessarily have to set it up that way. The executive director doesn't need to set it up that way, but it is a, in an exempt position. So it is a high level position um, with a lot of responsibility for conducting audits and investigations, developing the processes for these um, and overseeing them. This is a position that is unusual um, in the United States. Um, there aren't a lot of examples um, that are uh, very close. It is uh, more common in European countries. Um, and so we've been looking in that direction. Um, what I was hoping was that we could have a board discussion um, about the sort of general parameters of this position and desired qualifications that board members had for this position. Um, so uh, I wanted to be sure that I wasn't missing something um, uh, fundamental in my research. Um, if the board is willing, um, I would move ahead based on that. Um, if the board wants more input, um, I could bring a duty statement to the next meeting based on our discussion um, as we did in the June 14th meeting. Um, it isn't required for the process. It's a question of whether the board um, wants to maximize its input into the position um, or maximize um, the speed at which we put the um, put the um, request um, into the process. Um, so um, with that, um, uh, I, the, our next um, item is policies and practices and has an action item. So I do suggest that we pause here um, uh, uh, in order to discuss anything to do with hiring um, and personnel, um, as well as the chief privacy auditor position. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, one thing that is a bit procedural, but I wanted to mention is that I have not had an opportunity to see this presentation before this moment. It will have been really helpful to me. We're going to have a conversation about the chief privacy auditor to have known in advance so that I could have conducted a little bit of research myself and be more prepared for the conversation. So where possible, I will encourage this subcommittee and really all subcommittees to prepare these materials and provide them to the other board members in advance so that we can be more prepared. Um, and, and as to 
the more substantive questions, um, I have two. Uh, for the civil servant positions, I believe the slide said that um, we had not taken any action on that until last week where we met with DGS. Did I misread that or? I, I elided some, some detail. Um, we, we started working on some um, duty statements um, for sort of line attorneys some weeks ago, I, I didn't capture exactly when that was. Um, and we um, were working with GGS um, to find out how we could post civil service positions. Um, they connected us with the team two weeks ago, I guess, Angela. Um, and we met with the team. We did meet with the team last week. Um, um, that, But it wasn't. That wasn't the first that we were working on the civil service positions. And I said, go ahead. I was just going to add that with respect to attorney positions, much of the work that we're doing with the uh, potential retired annuitant uh, positions will is work that we will be able to use for those civil service classifications. A lot of that work um, will be very useful for that. You know, preparing duty statements and the workup that we need for those packages. I mean, I think um, if I'm if I'm understanding Ms. De La Torre's, um, what is underlying Ms. De La Torre's question, it did take us a little while to figure out um, what advice we needed to get for the civil service positions, how they fit together with the other positions, and to make time um, along with the various other processes we're following um, to make significant progress on that. So it has taken us some time. And I was um, going to say, and I should have started with just thanking both of you for all of the efforts. This is very complex. The presentation is really helpful. It really outlines um, possibilities that I, they were not in my radar. So thank you for all of the efforts. Um, I, I, on that, I was also a little um, unclear because I, if I recall correctly, the um, delegation that was provided to the chair will enable the chair basically to unilaterally without bringing this into a subcommittee, engage in hiring all of these staff positions um, in per, potentially in, in a more expeditious way. I don't know if that's the case, but I, I was gonna inquire as to whether that's the case. And if that's the case, why was the decision making to do this through subcommittee as opposed to just um, in a more executive manner um, by, the, by the chair? Thank you. That's a that's a very good question. That was that is my understanding as a delegation. Um, the subcommittees themselves can act in an advisory fashion. My understanding is that the delegation stands. So, for example, I can sign documents, and and somebody needs to sign documents. Um, so I've been doing that. Um, uh, Ms. Sierra, my understanding was that the subcommittee did have these items um, as part of its sort of research um, and work um, uh, scope. And Ms. Sierra has simply just been really, really generous. Um, we would not be where we are um, if I were having to do all of these myself, or beginning every starting um, and ending all of it myself. Um, without an HR liaison or an HR analyst, every single package has to be prepared um, by us. Um, and so it's honestly just been um, an issue of person power. Um, and this year has been incredibly generous with her time. Thank you for that update. I, I would like to just encourage um, the chair to be as expeditious as possible if it is through the subcommittee that this is better addressed uh, I'm, I'm, I support that, uh, but I also believe that for these kinds of positions, um, the chair should feel empowered to go through this process, do the interviews, um, hire as soon as possible, and not necessarily wait for feedback uh, from the board where that could delay the process, because I think it's of the essence. 
to get some of this done uh, sooner rather than later. And understanding the importance of the um, leadership positions, I think that because of the challenges that we're facing that you just very well summarized, meaning we don't have you know, manpower to get some of these things done, um, hiring at a lower level, even entry level positions, even uh, you know, fellowships um, will alleviate um, that challenge that we're facing. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that I support the idea of the chair being, um, you know, taking decisions independently from, from input from the board and in trying to expedite the process for, for these kinds of hirings. Um, the other um, item that I had in mind to discuss is the chief privacy auditor, but maybe we should leave that for the end and address all of the questions that other members might have and then kind of reserve a chunk of time for all of us to talk about that, please. Thank you, Ms. Elatoy. Are there comments and questions? Uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you for all of it. This is, you, the two of you have done an immense amount of work and I can appreciate how much the, 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 the roles, the roles that you've taken on have um, an incredible amount of importance for getting us up and running. So thank you. Um, a question, and I didn't know if it was embedded in the presentation. Um, we had talked at the last meeting about um, getting an understanding of how the attorney general had staffed the rulemaking process, how many people they had in, in what functions. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get kind of clear in my own head how we meet the deadlines and how many people we're going to need in order to do that. Obviously, the focus on hiring leaders is incredibly important, and perhaps the those leadership positions will help us to flesh that out. But I don't know if we're talking 5, 20, 50 people um, that are needed to, to draft that set of reg regulations. Do you all, um, do you know if, we have any insight into how the attorney general has, has staffed that function? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I do recall you bringing that up at the last meeting, which was a very good point. Um, uh, we have explored it with the attorney general's office um, and um, that will be part of the update from the regulations subcommittee. I, I do confess um, and I apologize for the oversight um, that um, I, I don't have the detail with me today, um, but I do have, a, I have the general, you know, the difference between five and 20 people and essentially how they staffed it. Um, and that has very much been um, in my mind as we've been pursuing in parallel leadership positions and um, attorneys who can help us with the rulemaking proceeding. I also wanted to say, um, I thank you for um, the kind words. Uh, I really want to um, thank Ms. Castanon, um, who is with us half time and who has been just doing a tremendous amount of work and helping um, with um, all of this. She knows the um, processes and she knows the people um, and she's just been an incredible asset. Ms. De La Torre, did you have a further comment? Uh, no, unless we want to talk about the chief privacy auditor uh, feedback that you requested. Yes, um, um, your hand is up, which is why. Um, I'm I sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and I knew you wanted to return to the chief privacy auditor, so that's fair enough. Um, if there's not further comments um, uh, on the board from about the sort of general hiring situation, um, then let's turn to the chief privacy auditor position, um, Ms. De La Torre. Sure. Um, like I said, I, I wish I had had more time to prepare, um, but I can confirm that this, my understanding is that this position was designed into proposition, into the proposition as um, the chief, um, the head of enforcement for the agency. And I think that the, it should be drafted when we draft the duty statement to reflect that. And uh, so I envision it as a direct report to the executive director 
and this person will be responsible for all of the enforcement activities and the enforcement strategies that the agency puts together. Um, I'm uncertain as to you know, what should be the size of the organization that should report to him or, or the positions. I really um, wish I had had the time to do more research, but I definitely can confirm that in my, in, in my recollection, this was envisioned as the head of enforcement. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And I do appreciate, I do appreciate that. Um, it was my hope to, it was my hope to have the draft of the statement to all of you and um, there simply wasn't time yet. Um, so I do appreciate that, thank you. And I do apologize that um, we are, we're having the discussion um, a little bit cold. Uh, no reason to apologize. Uh, I, like I said initially, there is the commitment that you have made to this agency. I think it goes unnoticed. Um, this is not a paid position, um, and I am fairly sure that you're putting more hours than you will put in a regular job. So thank you for for your commitment and for your service. Thank you. Other comments and thoughts, um, either on the position itself or the process for moving forward, Mr. Lay. Yeah, um, well, a quick question to, to go back to um, the other the other section. Um, was there any uh, attempt? I know you said there, it's really hard to get uh, IAA staff, um, borrowed staff for um, kind of the attorney positions. So is that, um, was that something you explored at all to get the rulemaking at least, like getting the questions together for public comment? Um, was there any possibility of that from the AG borrowing some attorneys? Um, and then I can get to the chief privacy auditor after that. Great, thank you. There will be an update on the um, path of working with the attorney general's office and the regulation subcommittee um, okay. uh, update. Uh, we discovered the, well, I discovered Ms. Sierra knew already, having already worked as a retired annuitant, but I discovered the retired annuitant um, option and we decided that it was important to, um, to um, uh, work with that option as well. Um, so we've been working sort of in parallel. Um, and then, yeah, so for the chief privacy auditor, um, yeah, I think uh, something that, uh, you know, it, you know, just based off the little I know uh, off the top of my head, um, you know, I know it is a lot more uh, common in the EU where there's the data protection impact assessments um, so, you know, I think familiarity with those impact assessments uh, would be a, a good requirement. Um, I think in, in this case, someone who works, um, who has experience with those private industry internal audits, uh, as well as external ones is, is important because, you know, there's always a, we're going to make sure that, um, you know, how compliance works within these businesses uh, and then how, um, they can adapt and uh, to make sure that when we develop these audits and we do enforcement that um, these impact assessments actually are substantive and that they um, they know what levers to push within business to make sure there's you know good compliance um, and then you know part of the uh, you know proposition 24 the the cpra was there was going to be a risk assessment uh, regarding profiling um, uh, by algorithmic system. So I would, I would like to, to see in the chief privacy auditor kind of good understanding of, um, you know, automated profiling, disparate impact, uh, those types of risks of, um, in that come up when you do profiling that may not happen um, on the basis of race or gender, but can have disparate impacts uh, on, on the other end of that. So making sure that as they develop, um, you know, audits, that those types of risks are assessed. Thank you, Mr. Lay. That's extremely helpful. Do you mind if I follow up with a with a? Do you have and you may not, which is fine. Do you have a, a sense in your mind as to um, the role of technical expertise, um, the role technical expertise should play? Of yeah, that? yeah. So definitely, I think. Um, well, I think that the, the future of risk assessment is you know, having AI audit AI. So I do think there is some sort of technical expertise that, that does need to be there. Um, thinking through how 
we can make um, these audits kind of on, on a larger scale, right? Uh, you know, we do need the, the, the investigations and we need companies to disclose on paper how they're doing their data protection. But uh, eventually I would like to see um, more automated auditing um, that, that at least alerts uh, the agency to whether there's potential discrepancies between what a company's stated you know, data protection controls are and what's actually happening. So I do think uh, technical expertise, expertise understanding of algorithmic audits uh, is, is a key um, yeah, job qualification. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Delatore? I just wanted to mention, we haven't uh, really talked about this um, as a board before, but in my mind, uh, one of the positions that is likely to be requiring, I think is required, is a chief technology officer. Mm -hmm. who, and this doesn't need to be a leadership position, but more an office that supports the different efforts that will be underway. I think that we will need that to support the rulemaking process um, because there are some aspects of the rulemaking process that are very technical. And I think that same office, the chief technology officer and, and the people who reported the chief technology officer could uh, efficiently assist the um, head of enforcement and the enforcement unit in questions that are more um, technology driven um, without undermining what um, uh, board member Lee said about the benefits of having a chief uh, privacy auditor that also has some technical expertise. I also think that independently we need, <clears throat> we need a group of people within the agency that are just technologists. Uh, because a lot of these, um, the way data moves these days, it's really driven by, by technology. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Are you thinking of something like the, um, the group, and I apologize, I'm blanking on the exact name of the FGC? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's an excellent model to consider. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Further comments on the Chief Privacy Auditor? Um, in that case, I would like to make a, a process um, point or ask a process question, I suppose. Um, within the delegation of authority um, under which I'm operating to accomplish various things, um, my understanding is I could, I could go ahead, uh, take this information, add it to what I know, work with Ms. Sierra, um, if she has time or not, to put all of this together. Um, of course, the board would have to finally appoint um, the chief privacy auditor. Um, so that's one path that we could take. Um, Ms. De La Torre um, may, of course, made a very good point that um, the board might need more time to consider. Um, so I am willing to either um, kind of go as fast as I can um, or um, to um, uh, bring a fuller package um, to uh, the next board meeting uh, for consideration. I'm happy to give my own opinion, but um, in, in, yeah, in my view, if we will, if we're going to have our next meeting in October 18th, um, which I understand um, is in the schedule, um, I will favor um, just making good use of that. Um, delegation that we have put in place and enabling you and the subcommittee to act as expeditious as possible. I don't see necessarily the need for us to discuss the, the, the specific language of the, of the, um, of the job posting um, as a board. Um, I think it, it, you know, in October 18, when we get an update, if there are questions, if there's comments, if there, if there are areas where there might be policy decisions, they could be built into the slides in the presentation and we can discuss them at that level. I think that would be more efficient. Thank you, Mr. Latore. Um, Mr. Lay, did you? Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I can go either way on this, right? I think the chief privacy auditor might have a lot of good input on um, the regulations, right? And uh, that, that and the rulemakings that get developed that enable them to do their job. 
Um, so uh, I, I would kind of support the, the more expeditious uh, solution, right? And then we, we would have the final say and making sure whoever uh, we hire uh, can do that. And I just wanted to add, you know, um, as a qualification, you know, forward thinking in terms of, um, you know, privacy compliance and audits, you know, because this, this industry moves so fast mm -hmm. and kind of understanding where uh, the future is going to be and what's, what's going to happen. And I also think that we're going to have a lot of other agencies coming to the CPPA to, to help out with kind of maybe their enforcement of, uh, say, fair housing or, um, you know, banking and other types of regulations. So I think um, that kind of knowledge base, and I, I mentioned that earlier with the disparate impact, you know, those are the areas that are key. Um, so yeah, just forward thinking in that kind of stuff. Thank you, Mr. Lay, that's very helpful. Ms. Sierra. Um, yes, I just wanted to note that, you know, I, I also agree um, that moving with this path that we're proposing is just to move ahead. And as a member of the Startup and Administration Committee, I'd be very happy to work with the chair um, on this and I have time to do that. So, um, but I'm in favor. And then what would the next step with the board would have a lot of input in the selection um, of the individual. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Thompson. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with a lot of, of, of what has been said. Um, just wanted to, uh, I, it's a close call to me, but I'm comfortable with moving forward and, and being expeditious. I agree with um, Ms. Delatory. I feel a little, I feel like I was caught a little flat footed with the request for input on the qualifications. So um, I don't know if there's a mechanism for us to leave the record open if we have any thoughts in the next couple of days, uh, if, if that, works um but I, I wouldn't want our weighing in to slow the process i think Ms. Sierra makes and, and others made a good point we'll have the opportunity to weigh in in the future um and i, I would i would want us to keep our focus on the roles that are critical to the rulemaking um and and so if 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 Mr. Lay is correct that this position could have some, some helpful input and influence on the rulemaking process, then it's something we need to move on quickly. Um, so that I, I was, I'm kind of on the fence, but I would err on the side of quick. So um, I, I think let, let's move forward, but to the extent that we'll, we will be asked to opine on things in a meeting, um, having a little bit of time to think about it ahead of opining um, would, would be great. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And again, I do apologize. Um, as far as mechanisms, um, we do have a fairly lengthy closed session. Um, and I believe and we will be in open session, go to closed session, come back to open session. So um, if there is something that occurs to you, um, I think there will be an opportunity to air it. And I will check with Mr. Phillips um, uh, during the break or something to be sure I'm not misspeaking. Um, thank you all very much for um, uh, putting your heads to this issue, um, even though I recognize I did ask you to think about it um, a bit on the spot. Um, again, I do apologize for that. Um, uh, my juggling um, has been as successful as it's been. So, um, so thank you all very, very much for that. Um, my you referred to the potential of an upcoming break, which I didn't know if that could be yes. sooner rather than later. That yes. Would um, I also um, could use a break. Um, so we have um, for this um, uh, se section, excuse me, agenda item, uh, we have uh, one more section, um, discuss the per diem policy, um, and we will be also taking public comment. Um, uh, I don't anticipate that will be a terribly long conversation, but we should, of course, leave uh, the possibility for a robust we, we should be sure that we um, understand that there can be a robust conversation. So um, if you would like a break, um, I would suggest that we take a, a 10 minute break. Um, and uh, Mr. Phillips, we can recess and just recall the issue when we come back, is that correct? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. And thank you for indulging me as I'm still, I want to be sure um, that I'm using the correct process. No problem. Um, so with that, let's take a 10 minute break and return 
at um, 11, 11. Uh, I will see you all back here then and we will recall um, this agenda item. Thank you very much um, for all of your input. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are um, back in session from a break, continuing with agenda item four of the California Privacy Protection Agency board meeting for September 7th and 8th, 2021. Um, uh, we were um, currently wrapping up at least the initial conversation about um, the um, need to hire a chief privacy auditor um, and the approach um, to doing that. It is my, um, my sense of the conversation um, that we are balancing um, ex being expeditious uh, with, um, with um, the board's uh, input. Um, and uh, we are uh, generally in agreement uh, to take an expeditious path um, so that I will take all of the input that I've received in this meeting um, and uh, start the process um, for uh, getting approval um, for the position. That said, um, uh, uh, other thoughts may occur to members of the board over the course of the meeting, in which case we can um, recall the item for um, some further discussion. Uh, and um, uh, um, uh, to give the board a little bit more time to think because they haven't had a lot of meetings. Um, if there is any um, uh, different view, um, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will move on. Wonderful. Thank you all very much for your input and your thoughts. Um, and we will um, continue with the next um, portion of the Startup and Administration Subcommittee's report. Um, in this section, we do have a recommendation for the board. Um, and I would draw the board's attention to the short memo um, that the Startup Administration Subcommittee prepared for you um, and the um, form that goes with it, if you would like. And I will turn it over to Ms. Sierra um, to present um, this um, portion of our agenda item. Great. Thank you, Chair Urban. And uh, before I kick this off, and I'm going to try to be... Um, fairly brief, um, but I want to thank the chair and others for their kind words. And I would be remiss if I did not thank our chair. Chair Urban has been working on the subcommittee with me, um, from what I can see, working around the clock, and that's only one subcommittee. So um, I'm just so grateful for your time commitment, your overall commitment and your leadership. So um, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, so now I will turn to the policies. I know that uh, we have a very full agenda today, so I will try to um, be fairly swift with this because um, as you have seen in your board materials, um, we have provided a memo outlining a policy, a per diem policy that we are proposing in a form with the form that we would be submitting as board members. Um, so in general, based on our discussions from our June board meeting, um, our subcommittee decided to prioritize the policies that we thought were of most immediate need. And the, the first policy we thought um, that should be prioritized was this per diem policy um, because it is set forth in statute that um, the CPRA does provide um, for a per diem $100 compensation to board members for each day on which they engage in official duties. Um, but in order to implement that statutory um, 
compensation, um, we do need to have as a board a policy in place um, to either to process and compensate board members. Uh, after I talk about the per diem policy, I will briefly talk about what we what we are proposing as our next um, priority would be to working on an incompatibility activity statements. Um, then potentially after that communications policy, but I will get to those after we have fully discussed the per diem policy. Um, so an overview of this issue, um, as all the board members know, the nature of our appointments is that we are volunteers. These are public service positions in which we are not receiving a salary. Um, however, our underlying statute um, does provide for what is called a per diem, which is essentially an honorarium. It is um, a rate of $100 um, for each day, this is, I'm just quoting the statute, for each day on which board members engage in official duties. We have a, um, on this slide the actual language of that um, statute. Um, in order to um, develop a proposed policy for our board, our subcommittee um, conducted research. Um, we, um, could, we have seen a number of per diem policies and learned of a number of per diem policies that other state boards have implemented. Um, this type of provision um, many uh, apply to many state boards and often the underlying statute has language that's almost identical to ours. So looking at other policies was very helpful to us. Um, we consulted with council and we also attended a um, webinar brown lunch that uh, that was focused on per diem policies as well as travel reimbursement that was hosted by the California Department of Consumer Affairs. They actually have a board and bureau relations unit. So they had a brown bag um, webinar that was very helpful to us. And what we found as a subcommittee is that state boards um, that have per diem statutes like ours um, have flexibility on the policy that they adopt to implement that statute. And there are um, a wide range of policies that have been adopted. There is not a one size fits all. Um, each board is going to be looking at their proposed policy or the actual policy they, they um, adopt based on the nature of their activities and the time commitment um, from board members, et cetera. On one end of the spectrum, we, see pol we saw policies in which a board only provided for a per diem for attendance of a board meeting, for example. Others were providing um, per diem compensations for a wider range of activities that were directly related to board, um, to board matters. We saw some policies in which um, a board member would receive a full per diem payment um, for any time spent that day, others that would break it out by the hour, um, and then others that would be, depending if a board member worked four, six, or more hours, um, would be compensated for that amount of time for a one day per diem. So after reviewing all that, we have um, come to a decision to recommend a middle path for our board. Um, we are recommending a policy in which our board members would receive this per diem $100 honorarium for every six hours engaged in official duties. Um, we are recommending that the policy can um, allow for the per diem for categories of duties that are directly related to board business, not only board meetings, but work, work for example, on um, subcommittee matters and preparing for those matters and preparing for those meetings as well. And we have a slide in, and this was also in your materials that list what we are recommending official duties um, include. You'll see the right hand of the slide, and that was in um, your materials as well. And we also are proposing that the six block amount, six hour block amount of time um, for the per diem compensation could be um, spread over multiple days because the majority of our um, board members have full-time jobs, are working in um, this board, wor board work 
in the evenings, weekends, other available time. So we thought it would be appropriate uh, for this board, and particularly since we're doing so much substantive work right now, to allow for um, six block periods of time to be spread over multiple days. And we have seen that example in other policies as well. And finally, um, because we want to ensure we have good record keeping, um, we have transparency, and we're tracking our agency's expenses in a timely manner, um, we are proposing that all board members will submit a per diem form each month. Um, it would be submitted the 15th of the month following the month in which you are um, requesting or, or, um, your per diem and you're noting your hours. You would submit the form even if you are not claiming any per diem for that month. And the form that we have provided to you, we have actually modeled that form on the form that's used by the California Medical Board. Um, so the, the, it looks very similar in structure and we pulled many of the components from their form. And assuming that um, we adopt a policy today, um, our proposal also is that for all work done until the policy was adopted, um, all board members would have until October 15th um, to submit a form for each month prior to prior to now in which they have been engaging in official duties as we have outlined um, on this slide so that um, we can process the per diem payments for board members for all the time that they have contributed until we actually had our formal policy. So we do have an action item um, uh, for this matter. And we're, again, we're recommending that we adopt the policy, uh, the proposed policy that we have provided to the board and just outlined um, at today's meeting. And that, you know, before any vote, we also invite board discussion or questions. Thank you, um, Ms. Sierra. Uh, as a process point, um, two things. First of all, um, we will have a board discussion now. Uh, we will finish the last small um, point in the um, subcommittee's presentation uh, and then go to public comment um, and then return to the action item so that we have the benefit of public comment before doing the action item. The second process point is that I wanted to, um, I wanted to um, let members of the public who are following along know that, um, that we are looking at um, part two of the meeting materials um, uh, in case you um, weren't sure which document we were looking at. Um, so thank you, um, Ms. Sierra. Uh, and uh, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the work that has been done in terms of putting together the um, per diem policy. However, I do not, um, I do not believe that uh, the first paragraph of the proposed per diem policy is a paragraph that aligns with the literature of the law. I think it's excessively burdensome and I think it's unnecessary. And let me go through all of those three things. Uh, first of all, if we approve this policy, what we're gonna be basically doing is instead of paying per day, we're gonna pay per hour or per fraction of an hour. That means that today, for example, where we will likely meet for over six hours, we will pay ourselves more than $100 and that, in my mind, is opposite to the language of the law. Um, our uh, chair, who I'm sure has worked more than six hours um, a day for quite some time, will be also in that situation where she will be paid over $100. And let me make sure that I think she deserves much more <laughs> than $100 for the, for the work that she has done. But again, the statute doesn't say so. The statute says that for each day, the maximum that we can pay ourselves is $100. I think it will also result in situations where individuals, um, individual board members who have done substantial work in a day will not be paid the full per diem of $100 because maybe they did two hours or three hours of work. So in my mind, that is misaligned with lecture of the statue. I think it's also burdensome. I'm an attorney. I 
charge my clients per hour. I'm used to the discipline of tracking my time in six minutes increments. It is burdensome. And I also uh, have to say that um, I actually, I have the records. I can go back to May and, and tell the board how many hours I have worked each day because I have basically been tracking my time the same way I track the, the time for clients. But I will assume that some other members are gonna be really having a hard time trying to figure out how many hours or how many minutes they work um, or they conducted um, board business uh, on you know, September 20th. So I think it's burdensome and it will result in denying um, per diem to um, those of us who might not have been tracking uh, our time to, to this kind of a specificity. And then the last thing is I just fundamentally think is unneeded. The statute says per day. A day is a day. We don't have to redefine what is a day and divide it into six hours that can be can be put together through you know different um, times working different days. Everything else in the policy seems reasonable to me. I will be happy to approve the rest of the policy, but that first paragraph where it says the board shall be paid as per the and allocated of $100 for each six hours of engage, engaging official duties, I disagree with. And I will um, suggest that we edit that and we just take the language of the law per day means per day. Um, so with that, I will vote against this policy if it's put forward to approval today. And I will encourage other members to do the same. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. So um, have I, I've highlighted the right part, correct? Yes, that's correct. If we eliminate that and we just say what the law says, which is per day, I will be happy to approve this policy today. So let me, um, if, let me see if I can, I, I heard more than one point in there. Um, so let me um, see if I can summarize. The first is um, the lack of a maximum for a day. Um, so that six hours, um, we could in theory, the way this is written in the book, two per diems, um, because we would have more than six hours. Well, we could have 12 hours, would be 12 hours. And that is not a one day per diem. Um, that, um, Ms. Sierra, I think is that, I'm surprised that council didn't notice that and we didn't notice that. Um, that makes absolute sense to me. Um, the second um, is that having to track um, the number of hours um, is burdensome. And I know you had a third point in there um, about hours sort of versus days, um, um, which we can also that, that is and That is unneeded. I, the, my last point is that is unneeded. Uh, the, the statute says the agency, uh, where, where is it? Um, for each day on which they engage in official duties, they is a very common term. It doesn't need to be redefined. It has a meaning in the dictionary. Everybody knows what's a day. A day is a day, it's not six hours. So we should just leave it be and say for each day of which they engage in official duties and then define official duties, which you, you have done, I think, really well. And if we wanna set some threshold where we say, <clears throat> you know, a, a simple exchange of emails for five minutes is not, does not constitute official use or whatever, whatever language we feel is appropriate to avoid a situation where um, we, a member can claim um, per diem in situations where are not appropriate. I, I'm all, um, you know, I will support that. Although I think that members are responsible enough to understand that that will not qualify for per diem and we can leave them to their, to their discretion. But, um, the first paragraph in my, in my opinion should, should be edited. Um, thank you. Uh, to give a little bit of background um, on the hours, um, uh, when we did the research, um, what we found uh, was that there is um, by a lot of boards, uh, a de there is the um, decision to define a day, um, which is your right, it's not defined in the statute. Um, there, uh, Ms. Sierra um, has the deepest knowledge on this, but my understanding is there was everything from um, one second um, on a given day um, up to eight hours 
um, being defined as a day. In addition, the Fair Political Practices Commission has an hourly amount. Um, we didn't go there um, in part because um, we were thinking of the, of the flavor of the point that you were making, Ms. Delatory, that this was really for a day. Um, the second um, sort of thematic um, item is that um, these are honoraria. Um, they're not intended to be pay. They're not intended to be salary. And we were trying to balance um, the fact that this is a volunteer position and these are honoraria with the reality that we understand um, that there is a substantial amount of commitment that board members are making. Um, so those were the things that sort of went into the hopper with our recommendation. Um, uh, I just give this background um, to help flesh out why per diem is actually defined and sort of what the ranges we saw were. Um, the board could, um, we were advised, choose essentially um, any uh, definition um, that, that makes sense to the board. Um, so I, I give that background. Um, I ask everyone to hold Ms. De La Torre's um, uh, thoughts um, and in, in their minds. Um, and then Mr. Thompson, um, if, you, um, if you would like to uh, be recognized. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, I appreciate what I, th I think the goal here was, which was to be good stewards of, of public money and um, apply some, some thresholds. I had a similar reaction that Ms. Delatore did, which is a plain reading of the statute is pretty clear. Uh, the, the people enacted the proposition and it reads for each day. Um, and, and that has a very plain meaning. You know, I think that if we want to give guidance to members that they're, you should use your discretion that de minimis amounts of time shouldn't be counted. Um, you know, the example given that, it, you know, if I responded to an email for five minutes, I'm not going to claim a, a per diem for that. Um, but it is we, we are effectively making the per diem $16.66 per hour um, rather than a $100 per day, um, which is clearly laid out in, in, the, in the ballot measure. Um, so I, I, would, I would agree with, with Ms. De La Torre's reading that it's, it's clear. Um, I also think, you know, for myself, I, you know, I, I would apply some threshold level of time for, for myself to not, you know, like, I don't mean to repeat myself. So, uh, so minimal amount of time, I would, you know, I'm not going to claim that. Um, but I, I do think we should go with what the, what the clear meaning of the statute is. Uh, and it, it appears to be very clear to me. Um, and I say that w with recognition and appreciation for the desire to um, be protective of, of public funds. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Sierra? Yes. Um, so what I see as a challenge here, you know, as the more, you know, working on it and looking at the policies, that if we were to make modifications to this, like, for example, you know, like, let's say either completely not, you have it just any time during the day with no de minimis claims, um, or a set amount of a threshold of time and have though maybe a ceiling of no more than eight hours per day. Um, but the struggle I have with this is that when it says for every day, I think the reality of the work that we're doing is that many board members may be doing like one or two hours a day, you know, in the evenings. And I think it would be really, um, in my view, important to have uniformity on this. And so we all have an understanding, you know, because I think there's a lot of subjectivity here of, you know, is that enough? Do we want board members to claim for two hours and for the hundred dollars or is that de minimis? And so I think having some of this detailed in a policy, in my view, is very helpful, um, would be helpful to me as a board member and for the public to understand um, what we are considering to be substantial service in order to receive the per diem. Because, you know, some could argue, well, a, a day is eight hours, typically. Thank you, Ms. I, I agree. I, I think a working day is eight hours. Thompson. Sorry for interjecting. Um, Go ahead. But 
I don't know that that's what's being applied here. And I think that the math is relevant. Mm -hmm. if, if each of us claimed per diem every single day of the year, we would come out with spending $182,500, collect for all five of us every single day for each year, um, which I, I think is, is, that's the cap on, on what board compensation would be. Um, and I, I would, I, I, I just think the statute's pretty clear. I think we're, we're changing something that is pre pretty clearly laid out. Sorry for, I didn't mean to interject Chairperson Urban. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, uh, I will uh, wait for other hands. Um, I would like to offer some of my own views while I wait. For me, it is, in, it is of utmost importance that we are transparent with the public about exactly what we mean when we are claiming per diems. Um, I, it is also, I think, useful uh, to allude to practice by other boards. Um, and it is a very common practice uh, among other boards to define a per diem as a number of hours. Um, I absolutely uh, thank Ms. De La Torre for catching the spread over multiple days um, issue and the fact that that creates no stop. But in my personal view, the board should um, decide what it means by a day. And if the board would like a day to be any amount worked on a day, that's the board's prerogative. Um, uh, we chose six hours because we thought it was a reasonable um, amount um, with the issue of the sort of backstop. Um, I would recommend that we revise this um, to um, something more like four hours, which is also quite common, um, and uh, or that we that we do that and or that we make clear um, that there is no more than one um, one uh, amount um, to be paid per day. Um, in my view, that is the best balance between transparency um, and uh, careful stewardship of public funds and recognition that this is an honorarium um, and um, uh, recognizing the board's work. Um, that said, I really do recognize the fact that the board, um, this board has been operating at a level of commitment that uh, most boards do not. And I think that is also important. Um, so I am certainly happy to hear more viewpoints, um, but my view would be that uh, we would define this. Are there further comments? Mr. Thompson. I, just, I have a question um, as far as um, the, the benchmarking of other, of, of other boards and the authority under which their per diem policies were established. If their per diem policies were subject to, were, were established with, you, you mentioned with similar statutory language as ours, um, where they say for each day, uh, is, that, is that right? That the ones you benchmarked had, had near, similar or near identical statutory authority. Um, that's one question and then if there was a number, it sounded like the range was anything, any work on a day was one bookend and the other was um, only for attendance at board meetings was the other end of the range, right? And then they fell in, in, in the middle. Because um, I'm struggling, I, I, I agreed with, with what Ms. De La Torre said. I mean, I think the, the wording is super clear. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant for us to adopt a policy other than the one that is consistent with the language that, that was enacted. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to get my head around why, why we should do that. Thank you. I apologize, it's a very large truck. Um, but I, I, I think I understood the, the last thing that you said, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, yes, most um, boards, um, at least that we researched, but I think it is most boards, uh, uh, operate under the Business and Professions Code, um, which does have quite similar language. We are unique in that, in, we, we're unique in that we have our own implementing statute with our own provision. 
Um, I believe that is also true of the Fair Political Practices Commission, um, but um, I do apologize in advance if I misspeak on that. Um, as far as defining the per diem, um, we could define it as any time in a day. Um, I, I will ask Ms. Sierra, I don't think that we came across any examples that didn't say anything about how it would be, um, how it would be calculated. Um, because for the very reason that the statutes say per diem and don't, it, you know, they're statute, it's statutory, so um, they don't go into a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree with the cap. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I think it's, yeah, the number of hours, I, I can understand that some folks have, have defined it uh, differently. Um, perhaps, I think the, the, you, you mentioned there was four hours, maybe we can just do, I do think there's some agreement needed on like what's a substantive amount of work um, in a day. So maybe split the difference, have it just the amount be two hours or three hours, and then have a, have a cap that, you know, with a cap that you can't claim more than six hours in a day um, or more than a hundred dollars in a day. So uh, that, that would be my suggestion, but um, I, can, I can see both sides on this one. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So um, one option, if I'm understanding correctly, would be to choose a different chunk um, to define per diem, maybe two or three hours to make clear that in any calendar day, one per diem only is available. That's, that's right. I disagree with the idea of having to track hours. Yeah. I don't know if other board members track hours, but it is not easy to track our hours with accuracy. I mean, how do you add it? I mean, I, I do it every day. And if it's to be done accuracy, accurately, it is, is burdensome. So I think it's much better to say a day. And then if we wanna agree that any day where there is less than an hour cannot be claimed, that's fine. But, but leave it as, as a day, because if we're gonna to have to say, I work 3.3 hours on this day and 4.6 hours on another day, we're imposing on ourselves a burden. And I, I am gonna, you know, it, it, we have to sign these statements confident that, that those hours that we're tracking are accurate. And, and to me, that's an additional lot of work that I would much prefer not to, not to impose on myself because as it has been mentioned before, um, the commitment to this board, I think by board members is at a, you know, a significant level already. And I don't know have a, you know, if we decide that for every day that we engage in one hour of work, we, we will receive a per diem, I want to remind everybody that this is a $100 per diem. We're not claiming a $1,000 per diem. I think Mr. Thomas did the math. Uh, I, I, and that gives you a, a pretty good reference, right? So um, again, I, I would much prefer not to track hours. OK, so Ms. De La Torre, um, Mr. Lay, I will call on you in a moment. I want just like to follow up with Ms. De La Torre to be sure I understand. Um, so Ms. De La Torre, would you support um, a, a, some kind of definition, however many hours that is, without the need to track hours? I'm looking at the form that we suggested, which does have hours and activity code, but it could just have a check mark for a day. Exactly. Yeah, just check mark the day. And we can agree, I, I, you know, minimum activity should not be counted. But I do believe that when we engage in one hour, and I want to have two hours of work that we take away from our families, when we're talking about per diem of $100, we shouldn't be concerned about claiming a per diem or allowing a member to claim a per diem in that situation. I think it's perfectly fair. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with that uh, approach um, as a, a good compromise. Maybe we just have some guidance that, uh, yeah, we don't have to track hours exactly because that is, that is a huge burden. Um, and uh, and just having some guidance for us, um, for you know, for board members to you know, like, all right, so non-substantive, anything like less than an hour, just don't count that day um, as, as, as a guidance. And we don't actually have to track the exact number of hours. Thank you, Mr. Lay. 
Um, I would certainly support uh, changing the reporting form so that um, it's a matter of reporting a day. Um, and then the question is, um, with a policy that has guidance or requirements for what a day constitutes, um, we could um, we could say, you know, one, anything less than X is not um, significant enough to count. Um, we could have it just be guidance. Um, I, I think there are a number of ways that we could accomplish this. Um, I would like to turn to public comment now. I think public comment is particularly important on this issue. Well, it's important on any issue, but um, if people in the public have comments, um, I would very much like to hear them. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, looks like we have uh, one comment to start here uh, from uh, Barry Weber. Personally, I hope I'm not the only person in the audience, <laughs> but I, I certainly appreciate the incredible intelligent work that you, you people are doing. I'm going to avoid for now, I'd like to go back to the, the topic of hiring because there wasn't an open period for comments there. I think you're doing a fine job and probably taking way too much time on this issue of, of uh, per diem because you're, I know you're all credible and you'll figure something out and anything that's simple is, is going to make sense. Um, the I think Mr. Lay had an incredibly valuable comment with respect to using technical support in the staff to support rulemaking as well as to focus on difficult things such as dealing with uh, auditing of uh, automated decision making, I would extend that to say that there you can have a significant impact on privacy in California if you even extended that to use automated automated support to evaluate privacy notices for dark patterns and for completeness. That would be just such a massive improvement to the beginning of enforcement. Um, so there's, I think there's lots of opportunity for leveraging technology um, and building it into enforcement. And, and I think you're going down the right path. I just wanna support that. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. And we, we very much thank you for your engagement. Um, I'm sure someone else will speak up <laughs> eventually. Uh, and as a reminder, if there is anyone else who'd like to make a public comment, uh, please press the raised hand icon on your screen. Or if you're connected by telephone only, uh, you may press star nine. Uh, looks like we have a comment from Gary Wright. Gary, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, I've been listening intently, taking notes, and I've already sent, uh, emailed you some uh, recommended comments. Um, uh, but the last discussion on per diem, uh, I, I, I'd like to agree with the what I think is a consensus that the CPRA was enacted by the voters, and there was very specific definitions in there. And I don't think that changing the definition of the per diem would probably be prudent uh, if that was the basis of some of the suggestions. That's number one comment. And uh, again, going back, I, I, I really enjoy hearing the dialogue and the direction that you're moving. Uh, but there's, uh, in regards to an earlier uh, 